Hey everybody, welcome back. We are back with a great war today. Um, yeah, I totally skipped episodes 13 and 14 by accident. <laughs> Appreciate all of you guys pointing that out in the comments for me. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna do that today. Alright, so as usual, I have my sidekick Roger here with me, and I have Miss Scarlet, and we've got her on her Scarlet cam. She is playing with her ball and keeping an eye out for some squirrels, as usual, outside. But, uh, yeah, so I'm a little, one of those people that's a little OCD, and I like to be very, very thorough with my, uh, with stuff that I do. And so that means that, uh, yeah, I could have just watched weeks 13 and 14 on my own and just kind of like gone on to uh, 17 and 18 because we've already done 15 and 16. Uh, I, I don't know why I thought we had done 13 and 14. It's just one of those mind tricks, I guess, that <laughs> my mind played on me and thought I'd already done them. So um, yeah, before we get into the video though, you know what time it is. It's comment time. I want to review some of your comments from um, the previous videos that we did. And um, if you don't want to watch this, you can skip it. I do put chapters in my videos, so you can go right to the reaction chapter if you want to. But first, let's, uh, let's look at some of your comments. All right, so our first comment comes from... Uh, paleo, pay, pay, pilo, pilo, uh, Federici, Federici, uh, Britain indeed had a presence in and around the Persian Gulf. Uh, they had protectorates over Kuwait, the Trucial states, modern day UAE, Bataan, or Bahrain, sorry, Bataan. Where can I get Bataan from? Uh, Bahrain and Qatar. Uh, Oman, Oman, and Yemen. I cannot read today, guys. Oh my gosh. Uh, and they had the colony of Somaliland, and of course India was not that far away. They also had the influence in Iran. So this must have been like some of the heyday of the uh, British Empire here. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I didn't know about uh, Britain having that presence in the, um, in the uh, Persian, well, not Persian, is it Persian Gulf? Like in that area. Um, you know, we always, the, the U.S. tends to get all of the flack for, you know, going over there and taking the oil and everything. Um, so I didn't realize that, uh, that Britain had a presence way before the U.S. did in, in you know, that region of the world. So, um, that's really interesting, actually. It's part of the, uh, world history that I guess I need to get to know a little bit more about. So, um, second comment is from Christopher... Um, Germany owned uh, the port in King. Uh, I'm gonna butcher these Asian names. I'm sorry. I don't know how to um, pronounce these, but uh, Qingdao, Qingdao, in eastern in eastern China. <sighs> A colonial possession similar to British Hong Kong. The Japanese declared war on Germany at the start of the war since they were allied to Britain because the German holdings in Asia had few troops. See, this is, I don't know this history about Germany being over there in that part of the world. I know that there were a bunch of colonial powers in, in Europe. So we had Britain, we had the Netherlands, I think, um, Germany, I think Portugal, Spain, a lot of them, France, you know, so a ton of like European countries had colonial ambitions around the world i guess i just don't know like where all of them were in like the history of that so uh that's definitely part of my history <laughs> i'm gonna have to fill in here but um east asia squadron a smaller german fleet escaped to south america to avoid destruction by the japanese fleet when they attacked the city where they encountered and destroyed some british ships hope that helped Okay, so that's, I guess that's where South America was brought in. So it doesn't feel like there was a whole lot going on in South America. It was just a little battle, maybe. And uh, yeah, and Germany was in Japan. So um, yeah, I feel really ignorant right now about all of this. Uh, Andrew Charles. Turkey was not 
duped into the war. They were going to join anyway. The Ottomans had two battleships which were just being completed in a British shipyard. Britain seized these vessels for the Royal Navy when war broke out. It wasn't illegal, but the Turks were not amused. It was propaganda victory for Germany because um, the SMS Gobin, which had to seek shelter in Turkey anyway, could then be gifted to the Ottomans, which went a long way to bringing them over. So it sounds like Turkey and Britain were allies and then that switched when the war started. So yeah, I feel like there's some hidden history there that I don't, that I'm not privy to. Um, so I don't know what all of the, the details are here, but it sounds like Britain was allowing or was building ships for the Ottomans and then war broke out and the Ottomans switched over to Germany's side. So, okay. I think that's the gist of it, but you can let me know if that's right or not. Okay. So fourth comment, Mike Lavoie. Uh, the cloth haw is just a big medieval marketplace where merchants could do business. They traded mainly cloth, but other goods too. Um, I think some people were like uh, weirded out that I didn't understand what a cloth haw was. I've never heard of that term before. We don't have those over here in the U.S. to my knowledge. Um, medieval marketplace. So this is a part of European history that I'm oblivious to. And... Uh, I kind of thought like maybe it had something to do with cloth, but I didn't know like, you know, sometimes people name these halls and buildings random things for, for no real reason. And then sometimes there's a lot of meaning behind it. So anyway, appreciate you guys explaining to me that that's where they used to like trade cloth and stuff. So uh, next comment, HD or H Dreamer. South America wasn't really involved directly. It was just a naval battle between the German and the British flotilla of the uh, co off the coast of Chile. The German ships coming from German colonial possessions in China, which is where the Japanese come in as they were trying to take those. So the German ships were coming from German colonial possessions. Also, the Germans were in China, not Japan, which is where the Japanese come in as they were trying to take those. So they were the Japanese were trying to take we're trying to basically invade China and take the German colonial possessions over. Okay. Okay, so Britain was in China with Hong Kong. See, I don't even know that history. I don't even know that history of Britain. Literally, I had no idea that Hong Kong was like a British territory or anything until very recently when I, after I started my channel and I started hearing or reading comments about that and stuff. Uh, I was totally oblivious to that for some reason. I don't know if we ever really learned the history of that uh, over here. So um, we must not have because I had never heard of that before. So, all right. Uh, next comment is from Mark Kettlewell. Uh, pronounce uh, Eeps as, or Eeps. I just did it wrong again. Eep as Eep, as you get it. Uh, the British joke only called it wipers. I remember Indy Nidell uh, mentioning that, and I I pronounced it wrong in the last uh, video that I did too, so I'll try to remember that it's Eep. Um, and our last comment is from Greg underscore MCA. Admiral von Spee was in command of the German East Asia Squadron, a cruiser group based at the German-owned port of Tsingtao in china japan at this time was allied with the uk and was buying british ships boy so you guys in britain were selling or selling buying or not buying selling and making ships for japan and the ottomans so you guys were in the uh i guess armory business <laughs> kind of like the us is these days i guess we saw all of our stuff to other countries um uh, buying British ships and being so far from home at the mercy of Japan, Von Spee decided to take his flotilla and find a way uh, find a way home to be more useful to Germany. Avoiding Japan and British bases, he decided to cross the Pacific Circle around South America and try to find a way through the British blockade in the North Sea. However, he first encountered British cruisers off Chile. And then British battle cruisers in the Falkland Islands, where he went down fighting. Okay, 
So basically, it uh, sounds like he just got in a skirmish with the British on the way to China slash Japan um, off the coast of South America. Okay. I kind of think I'm putting that together now. So, oh man, guys, so much history is so confusing. It takes a while to sort it out in your head, you know, when you first start learning about all of this stuff. But I'm going to go ahead and put in my earbuds here. Let's, let's check in on Scarlett and see what she's doing. She's going to entertain you guys while I put my earbuds in. She's being a very patient pup right now. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. We're going to watch uh, episode uh, week 13 first, and then we'll get to uh, week 14. So let's see. Uh, let's kind of backtrack a little bit and see if we miss anything important um, by skipping <laughs> these weeks. I have a feeling that there's probably going to be a couple of things in here that uh, I need to know about. So let's uh, let's see about, let's see what Indy Nidell has in store. Oh, my door's open and Scarlet decided to leave. So okay. <laughs> Right. Europe had been at war for less than three months, but already hundreds of thousands of young men had died horribly. In the interests of morale and patriotism, the media in each warring nation had portrayed its side as good and the enemy as evil. And what we begin to see is that there was a gap created between what people believed about the war at home and what was actually happening on the front. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. At the beginning of the week, the Russians were crossing the Vistula to try and stop the Germans, who were intent on capturing Warsaw. The Austrians had broken out of the siege of Przemysl, but were badly beaten by the Russians on the River San, and the British had just arrived at a sleepy little Belgian town called Ypres. German Army Chief of Staff Falkenhayn had assembled a new army under the Duke of Württemberg to take over the right flank of the German forces in Flanders, which is this part of Belgium and northern France. A lot of the new units were reservists, though, middle-aged men past campaigning or young recruits that hadn't really been trained, and in their first few days of battle, they would make catastrophic mistakes. Now, the only gap on the Western Front through which either side might possibly make some sort of decisive maneuver was a narrow corridor right here. And that's where the action was happening. On Sunday, October 18th, the British headed eastward from Ypres towards Menin, nearly 20 kilometers away and in German hands. And there were a few skirmishes, but nothing major. The next day, as the advance progressed, British pilots reported huge columns of advancing Germans who would be upon them in hours, so the British withdrew to a low ridge overlooking Ypres. This area would be known as the Ypres salient. Now, a salient in battle is a projection of the line like a bulge, which means that the enemy can attack it on three sides. The Ypres... Okay, I really like this graphic right here, or this picture. Um, I don't remember any of the other videos that I've been watching on uh, these battles and so forth showing me an actual picture of of what the layout of the land looked like. And there's Eve is a tiny town. <laughs> I, the way he has been talking about it, um, I had thought it was a, a little bit larger, like more of a city type thing, but. When you look at it here, you can see how rural it is. And then there are smaller little villages, I guess is what they would be called, um, close by. And you can see the roadways in, and you see the river. I And it looks like there's some mountains or hills off to the top right up there. This is really interesting. I wish that uh, more of these videos showed me this type of picture of the battlefield and because um, this gives me a much more realistic look at the layout and and what it was like actually uh, I get way more from this actually than I do from one of the animated maps that they tend to show all the time not that those aren't valuable or whatever they are in their own right but this uh I, I love this okay so this gives me a much, much better idea for 
just like what it looks like in the layout and stuff. It's very cool. Deep Salient would be the scene over the next four years of some of the bloodiest and harshest battles in all of human history. On the 20th, the Germans attacked along the whole front, 24 divisions against 19. But the main contest this day was at Ypres, where 14 German divisions attacked seven British, though most of the German forces were Württemberg's reservists. The British were outnumbered in men and artillery, but they were equal to the enemy in machine guns, and they managed to hold their line because of their superiority in rapid rifle fire. Mm. Now here we find, as we did at the Battle of the Mons in August, the stories of the Mad Minute. A Mad Minute was, according to the British soldiers of the Great War, the art of hitting 15 targets in one minute with a bolt-action rifle, which the British professionals were trained to. And legend has it that at both Mons and the first action at Ypres, German soldiers thought they were facing machine gun fire when in fact it was only intense rifle fire. The German hmm. forces... That's also really interesting to me too because it's, it's a part of warfare of this period that I hadn't, or this period and earlier that I hadn't really given much thought to. And uh, I recently, we did a live stream last Friday of uh, Sharp's Eagle, episode two, which is the, the British miniseries or a British show about the 95th rifles during the, the uh, Napoleonic era. And um, I'm watching that over on Patreon if you're interested in that. But um, in that last episode, they made it, they had an entire scene about uh, the British being able to get off three rounds a minute, which uh, previously they were only able to do two rounds a minute and the French were doing three. And so Sharp had to train them to do three rounds a minute in order to have any hope of, you know, competing with the, the French. And... Uh, it was just an aspect of warfare that I hadn't really thought about that much previously. I mean, I think I'd heard of, you know, how many shots you can get off in a minute in movies and stuff from uh, that era. <laughs> Scarlet's found a squirrel. Um, but it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating what they had to go through and the type of training they had to go through. Like, part of their training was just how many shots you could, you could get off in a minute. Which seems so like foreign to us today because we don't have to, you know, worry about stuff like that in you know modern warfare. It's just a really interesting aspect of um, older war warfare that I hadn't really thought much about, and so it's, it's I, I find it fascinating kind of learning about how that was part of their training and part of the strategy that they had to employ on the battlefield. So has made the novices' mistake of advancing in large masses and presented huge targets to the British rifles, suffering terrible casualties. And for the next three days, they continued banging their heads against the British lines, attacking by both day and night on a widening front. Looking at it objectively after the fact, these attacks were exercises in futility along the lines of the French attacks we saw at the Battle of the Frontiers in August, with devastating losses for the Germans and the salient held. Those Germans were volunteers, doing their part for the fatherland, and they had heard for three months that the British troops were a joke and would be easily overcome, so they rushed off to die. On the British side, we also see the public failing to understand what was actually happening. British General Smith Dorian wrote, quote, I was struck by the fact that people in England didn't in the least realize the strenuous nature of the fighting at the front, or that we were a long, thin line without reserves, which might be broken through at any time. Their minds seemed set on what appeared to me a ridiculous fear of an invasion of England." End quote. Hmm. There was no danger of that at the moment, for it was true stalemate in Belgium and would be for the next four years. Further north along the line, what, the remnant- So how much of that is uh, along the same lines of what happened in World War II? Because there was that also fear of, of uh, invasion of England in World War II. And I'm learning more about that as I watch Dad's Army over on Patreon, uh, which is all about, you know, the Home Guard um, in England during World War II. And just kind of seeing what, what their fears were and what, you know, they were training against, you know, these possible invasions of, uh, of Germany into England and stuff. So did stuff like that exist for World War I then? Because... Um, I think this is the first time I recall Indy talking about the the English being nervous about an invasion during World War One. Uh, if he mentioned it before, um, I just don't remember. But 
Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, was there any sort of like organized effort to defend England like there was in World War II? Or is it more of just like a concern that Englishmen had? Um, and they, I don't know, and they didn't really do much about it, I guess is what I'm asking, so. In Belgium and would be for the next four years. Further north along the line, the remnants of the Belgian army, now down to around 60,000 men, were holding the coast at Newport, at the mouth of the Isère River. The Isère is a narrow river, but it has embankments, and it was a major military obstacle for the Germans. And the Belgians fought valiantly, earning the praise of even their enemy, who were unable to break through. There were, however, breakthroughs on the Eastern Front, where the war had become a war of perpetual motion for the time being. The Russians had been sending troops across their bridgehead on the Vistula River for over a week now, fighting off the Germans who had been trying to take Warsaw. Early on, the Germans had the advantage, but Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff had completely underestimated the size of the enemy, as Russian reinforcements never stopped coming in, being cleverly and secretly well deployed by the Russians. From October 18th to 23rd, the Russian army, after weeks of preparations, began its own attack, even threatening to surround the Germans, who began to retreat on the 20th, realizing that with the mud and the sheer number of opponents, they would not be able to take Warsaw. Further south, the Austrian chief of staff, Konrad, tried again to take on the Russians with his army, this time at Ivongorod. This was not as prudent as the German retreat. On the 22nd, the Austrians attacked, and four days later, they were forced to retreat with 40,000 Austrian casualties. Once again, the Russians would surround Przemysl Fortress, garrisoned by 150,000 men, and it would once again be an Austrian island in an ocean of Russian territory. And since I mentioned oceans, we should turn our attention to the Yellow Sea, where the Japanese had the German port of Tsingtao under total blockade. This week, the German torpedo boat S-90 slipped out of the harbor and sank the Japanese cruiser Takachiho with a single torpedo. 271 sailors were drowned. The S-90 was, however, unable to run the blockade and return to Tsingtao afterwards and was scuttled by the Germans when she ran low on fuel. There was- Okay, so Tsingtao, so one of your comments mentioned that in comment time. Um, so Tsingtao was the uh, German, German port in, was it in China? Um, let me, let me, uh, I don't even know, I don't even know where the Yellow Sea is, guys. So I'm going to look this up here. Uh, I, mean, I mean, assuming it's by Japan or China, but I don't know exactly where it is. Okay. So it's, okay, so it's kind of like in this, I don't know, bay type area. It's not really a bay, but it's in a, it's in a, uh, just realized I've got the wrong camera on me. <laughs> That's not great. Okay, there we go. That's better. Um, so, it's by, okay, it's between South the Korea, it's between Korea's and the two Koreas and China. Okay. Then we have the East China Sea, the Sea of Japan up here. Philippine Sea, South China Sea, Sulu Man, I didn't realize how many different seas there are. Gulf of Thailand, oh my gosh. Because you just learn about the oceans, you know? And, oh, here's one, Sea of... Oh, I can't even pronounce that. Um, you know, you just learn about the oceans and you don't even, like... Um, realize all of these little seas exist, you know, unless you like study geography or whatever. Okay, so I was gonna want, I was gonna see if I could find like the, uh, that port that he's talking about in the Yellow Sea, but I think that's gonna take up too much time. Okay, let's just get back to it. Was one very important non-battlefield event that happened this week that really shows the divide between the reality of the battlefield and what the public thought at home. This week saw the signing of the Manifesto of the 93. What this was, was a proclamation by 93 famous German artists, scholars, and scientists giving their total support to the German cause in the war. 
In the comments section, you can find a link to read the whole thing yourself. But basically, it says that the signers are responding to the lies of their enemies. They say that it is not true that Germany caused the war, and it is not true that Germany trespassed in neutral Belgium or carried out the reported atrocities there, such as the destruction of Louvain. Everything was done in self-defense. A counter-manifesto, the Manifesto to Europeans, was drafted by the pacifist Professor Nikolai, but gathered only three signatures. And one of them had actually also signed the other manifesto. The other two who signed were both scientists, Otto Buch from Heidelberg, and a scientist from Switzerland named Albert Einstein. So at the end of the week, the Austrians are defeated once again. The Germans are retreating from the Russians. The war is heating up in the Far East and on the Western Front. Huge German offensives are being stopped with devastating losses in men, many of them too young or too untrained to belong in battle. Lloyd George, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer and later Prime Minister, made one of the most legendary speeches of the war on September 19th to address the costs of the war. He said that this war, a war to end all wars, was being fought to free Europe from the rule of a military caste, and that the people of the allied nations would in the end gain more than they could comprehend in a new moral regeneration and a political rejuvenation and realignment. This was a bill of false goods, because when none of this happened in 1918, the anger and disillusionment of the people was enormous. He could have simply chosen to tell the truth, that the British, French, and Russians had to pay a terrible price in blood to lose the cream of a generation to win a victory that really gave no new advantages, but that this sacrifice must be borne simply to avoid worse things if Germany won the war. I mean, to be fair to him, though, unless I'm reading this wrong, I mean, he can't predict what's going to happen in the war. You know, I think he's... Obviously, he was giving a rah-rah speech, you know, to try and boost morale and get, you know, the the nation of Britain behind him and behind the cause or, or whatever. Uh, but, I mean, it sounds like Indy is accusing him of lying to everybody when, like, he doesn't know what the outcome of the war is going to be, you know? I don't know, unless I'm just misunderstanding what Indy is saying right there. But I think this might be a little bit of an unfair assessment you know, towards him, maybe. But you guys can correct me down in the comments if I'm uh, misunderstanding that. After watching our weekly episodes, you might have some questions about certain details or just <clears throat> generally want to know something about us. For exactly these... Okay, so he's just telling us about the, the special videos that they have right there. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to uh, week 14. And let's take a look at week 14 and what's going on there. And Scarlet has abandoned us here. I think she's gone to look for squirrels. In the last three months and two days since the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia, hundreds of thousands of men have died violently in battle. These men were the professional or trained conscript armies of Europe, but with their passing and with no end of the war in sight, the warring nations were now forced to send untrained recruits, even teenagers or middle-aged men, to die in battle like lambs to the slaughter. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. When we left off, we saw the Germans retreating from Warsaw, the Austrians launching and losing a big attack on the Russians at Ivongorod, the British and Germans suffering enormous losses at Ypres, the Belgians holding the line at the Isar, and the Japanese blockading the German port of Tsingtao. Here's what happened next. On the Western Front, German Army Chief of Staff Falkenhayn had assembled an army of new recruits to fight at Ypres in Flanders. And as novices in battle up against British professionals, they had died by the thousands, marching in large masses up against machine guns and rapid rifle fire. But there were thousands more German recruits coming, and this week, the new reserve recruits managed to gain some ground further north. On October 24th, they crossed the Isère River. Now this was really bad news for the Belgians, as the Germans could finally reach the sea. The Belgian commanders proposed retreat, but King Albert refused. The situation called for something drastic, though, and after a further 20,000 Belgian troops were lost in battle, something drastic was done. 
the lock gates at Newport were opened at high tide to flood the surrounding land with seawater. And after a few days, the Belgian countryside was flooded a mile wide as far south as Dixmude. This was impassable and the Germans were forced to withdraw. The Allied left flank was now secure and Albert now not only was king, he was a national hero. Okay, <laughs> so... Um... What did that do to the Belgian people, though? Um, did they were they given the opportunity to evacuate, or ruin? I mean, that seems like it would ruin a lot of people's uh, land and property and all of that stuff. So, um, I mean, I guess you have to take that into consideration. But you also have the argument of this is war, so you know we have to do what's necessary, and you know you might have to take some loss. <laughs> some losses of personal property and stuff to do that. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I don't think, I mean, I've heard of the Japanese or the Chinese like uh, opening the dams to the, is it the Yellow River in World War II? They killed like hundreds of thousands of, of their own people when they did that. Um, I think it was a similar tactic to this. So uh, I'm hoping that Belgium you know, took precautions to prevent a huge tragedy like that. So, yeah, uh, again, this is a tactic in war that I just, I had not really um, learned about previously. So it's, it's interesting to kind of hear uh, how some of these countries are coming up with, uh, or things that they're coming up with to, to stop the, uh, the enemy. Some kind of like non-traditional tactics that, I wouldn't think about like opening dams to flood, you know, areas. Now secure, and Albert, now not only was king, he was a national hero. As a side note here, now, is this, one of the ambulance. Is this really, is this Albert related to Prince Albert in England at all? Or is this a completely different Albert? Sorry guys, I'm a little, I'm a little like, um, hazy on the royalty and, all of that stuff still. Ambulance drivers around the Newport area was British aristocrat Dorothy Fielding, who, for her work on the Western Front, became the first woman to win the British Military Medal for Bravery. She also received the French Croix de Guerre and the Belgian Order of Leopold II for her service. I just thought she deserved a mention here. Looking back, German hopes of reaching the sea were by now as vain as British hopes of pushing the Germans deep into Belgium. And we see further south that the battle on the Ypres salient was now the battle for the Ypres salient. Falkenheim was still optimistic about breaking through here and nearly did so at Neuve Chapelle the 27th, but he was beaten back in hand-to-hand -hand combat by Indian troops the next morning. But German reinforcements were being brought up along the whole sector and Falkenheim's next offensive would soon begin. See, to him, the capture of Gelleveld was essential and a prelude to the eventual capture of Ypres and the sea. In response, French General Foch agreed to send support from further south to help the beleaguered British, but it would take a few days to arrive. The Germans moved into position. I'd like to take a look at those British troops now for a minute. When the war broke out, the British regulars were the only fully professional army in Europe, but because of their small numbers, they'd initially been mocked. However, over the past three months, they'd repeatedly shown their capability in the field, but the race to the sea and the first battle of Ypres would mark the end of the British regular army and usher in a period of conscription because of the following numbers. Three months ago, British commander John French led 84 battalions with nearly a thousand men each. As November began, only 35 of those battalions had more than 200 men remaining. 31 oh had between 100 and 200, and 18 battalions were down from nearly a thousand to fewer than a hundred men. But it certainly wasn't just the Gosh. British who were forced to recruit new and often untrained soldiers. In the battles of Ypres and the Isère, the German army had sent tens of thousands of raw recruits into battle with no experience of battle or training, and their losses were catastrophic. At the cemetery of the German Volunteer Corps in nearby Langemark, the bodies of 25,000 student soldiers lie in a mass grave. There are gravestones that read such names as Musketeer Brown and Volunteer Schmidt over graves that contain several bodies each. A testament to the Kindermord by Ypern, the massacre of the innocents at Ypres, 
which it was, when in a desperate attempt to break through, the Germans sent men who had no business being on a battlefield against the best trained soldiers in Europe, the British regulars. Now the British, as we've seen, had the occasional luxury of reinforcing their troops from their whole empire, but they weren't the only ones. Russia had been bringing troops from Siberia and Central Asia to fill out her ranks, and they had been arriving for the past two weeks, turning the tide in the east against the Germans. The Germans had been retreating from their aborted attack toward Warsaw, realizing that the sheer number of Russians was simply too much to attack for the moment. There was heavy fighting further south, though, as the Austrian army was disengaging and falling back from their huge loss to Russia at Ivangorod. Austria was, by now, in the grip of an ammunition shortage, with artillery rations down to only four shells a day per piece, and there was a big defeatist mood among the Austrian army. This was compounded by an outbreak of cholera among the troops, which killed nearly 4,000 Austrians this month and weakened many more. Since it took time for the vaccine to be authorized and then distributed, many Austrian soldiers faked the symptoms to get away from the front lines. Austria <laughs> oh further God. had the problem of Slavic soldiers defecting to join the Russians, seeing them as their true nation and not mm. the multinational Austro-Hungarian Empire. So the Battle of the Vistula, also called the Battle of Warsaw, ended, and it did with a ringing Russian victory. The Germans and Austrians were pushed back to their original positions from which they'd begun their offensives weeks ago, and Russia had made up a lot for her losses to the Germans two months ago. But Russia would have more to deal with in the future than merely the Austrian and German empires, it seemed. For on October 29th, the Ottoman Imperial Navy bombed several Russian ports on the Black Sea. Russia might soon have a third empire to fight. There was a lot going on at sea this week, actually. The Audacious, one of Britain's Wait a most. Where, where is that? Several Russian ports okay. on the. It is. Is this the Medici? Is this in. Oh, shoot. Oh, guys. I wish I knew. I feel like this is around the Mediterranean, but I don't think it is, actually. Let me see. Um, Lax. No. Yeah, of course. I know it's not the meta. I knew it was like close to it, but not. Okay. I I forgot that the Black Sea was kind of like in the middle of uh, everything here in Europe. So, okay. So we're by. Oops. Okay, north of Turkey and Ukraine. So the Black Sea kind of like separates Turkey. Kind of like the the Mid East, sort of from uh, from Europe. Okay, along with the Mediterranean, really. What's this other sea right here? Of course, oh, the Caspian Sea. Okay. I th I feel like I, I used to know this uh, back in the day when I was in school, like when we were learning geography, um, but I've forgotten. So let's go back. Okay. Black Sea, Russia might soon have a third empire to fight. There was a lot going on at sea this week, actually. The Audacious, one of Britain's most modern super dreadnoughts, was sunk by a German mine off the Irish coast. Since she took about 12 hours to sink, all crew were evacuated, but this was a real blow to the British fleet, who were much stronger on paper than in reality, and the sinking was not officially reported until after the war, for morale reasons, and Audacious still appeared in the fleet lists. However, there were American sailors on board who took photos of the ship, and the sinking appeared in the American and subsequently the world press. So the cover-up didn't do the British authorities a whole lot of PR wonders. Also this week, the German light cruiser Emden attacked Allied ships at Penang, which is now part of Malaysia. In a quick raid, the Emden sank a Russian cruiser and a French destroyer before fleeing. The Emden was alone in the area. The rest of the German East Asia squadron had left for Germany at the beginning of the war, and she continued her raiding adventures for another 10 days until being damaged by the Australian warship Sydney and being run aground. Okay, I have a question about these ships, okay? We always see this little abbreviate, and I'm, it's not an abbreviation, it's a, um, shoot, what's the word? For? Well, I guess, Maybe it is, it's not, I don't know. HMAS, USS, HMS, 
um, SMS. Like those, uh, those at the beginning. I, free, I don't know what the term is for it. Um, you see that at the beginning of the ship names, basically. Um, and I, I'm just now like starting to figure out that I, I know that the USS is the, I guess, United States something, uh, United States ships, <laughs> United States service. I don't know. Uh, HMS for the Brits. I have no idea what HMS stands for. Hi. Um, yeah. You guys let me, what does HMS stand for? HMAS. So Austria, Australia obviously is part of the Commonwealth. And so they're probably going to have the same, um, designation as the British ships. Austra I'm sure I'm assuming that the A is on, stands for Australia there. SMS for the Germans. I don't, I don't know what that stands for. Um, so I'm just realizing now that each country has like their own, their own thing. Um, I'd never really thought about that before. So if you guys let me know, first of all, what are, I'm sure there's like an actual name. Scarlet's phone. Scarlet's phone. Scarlet. Hush. Um, Scarlet has found uh, a squirrel. Anyway, uh, so yeah, what I'm trying to say is, got off track. Let me know what those things stand for down in the, in the comments and what they're called, because I'm sure there's like a, a name for these designations, um, like a military term for it, maybe, that I don't know. Uh, so yeah. During her raids, Emden had captured or sunk over 20 civilian vessels and become the scourge of the local seas. Now, before I wrap things up today, I'd like to tell an unrelated side story here that I don't know where else to put. I got this from Max Hastings' book, Catastrophe. At this time in Ypres, Ronald Coleman was wounded in the leg and the war for him was over, but he went on to become a Hollywood star. Funny thing is, his regiment also contained Basil Rathbone, Claude Rains, and Herbert Marshall, who all also became Hollywood stars. Oh, what are the odds guys. of that? So at the end of the week, the Belgians are flooding away the Germans. Further south, the British are awaiting French help while the local Germans get ready for a huge new offensive in Flanders. The Russians are on top now against both the Germans and the Austrians, but Russian ports have just been bombed seemingly by the Ottomans. It was also around this week in 1914 that the term no man's land appeared, describing the space between the rival trenches. So when would it stop? Hmm. Is a good question. Now that hundreds of thousands of men had died and the warring nations were recruiting teenagers and students to send into battle, when would it all stop? When would we win? Well, it wouldn't stop for another four years after a shocking number of those new recruits died violently in the mud or drowned beneath the seas because, as George Orwell so simply put it, the only way to swiftly end a war is to lose it. Even though this war had taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of men, like any war, it also had its share of mythical heroes whose stories would fascinate and terrify common soldiers on both sides of the trenches. One of these larger-than-life figures was Manfred von Richthofen, a.k.a. the Red Baron. Check out this special video we made. All right, guys. All right, well, uh, so that video on the Red Baron, I think we're going to pair that with the one on Switzerland that uh, I thought I was going to do next. Um, those are the two special videos, uh, so I think I'll we'll pair that one with the Switzerland video uh, talking about Swiss, Swiss neutrality, and uh, we'll do those, those two next, I think. Um, so yeah, a lot going on here, a lot going on. Um, I'm definitely like putting together the whole Flanders Fields thing now that I'm learning about Ypres and you know all of the fighting that went on there. Uh, and kind of like the stalemate that was kind of going on there and stuff and all of the people that were dying, all the soldiers that were dying. Um, I do understand, I think a little bit better, the, uh, the concept behind Flanders Fields, which is something that I was, I had never heard of before until I started learning more about World War One on my channel. So I think the first encounter I had with it was learning about Gallipoli and the Anzacs. Um, and then of course I, I heard the song as well now, but yeah, seeing seeing uh, all the moving pieces there has kind of like helped cement that a little bit more in my head, I think. So 
Wow, uh, very interesting. I'm, you know, it's a lot of information that, that I'm having to piece together, but it's slowly like coming together in my head. And so just little things like Germany having a presence over in Asia, Japan allied with Britain, Britain working with Belgium. Um, the Russians, you know what, throughout all of my videos, whether it's World War One, World War Two, whatever, I'm seeing like this this pattern of like the Russians are able to always produce these huge numbers of troops. And I know that they're a fairly large population, but they're not as big as like the US and China. And maybe they were as big as the US back then. I'm not sure what the population of the US was in 1914, but um, it seems like that they're, they're always able to like rival uh, countries like China, for instance, in the number of troops that they have, but they're a fraction of the population. So it's really interesting. I don't know why that is, whether they just conscript a bunch of people and force them to fight or what, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but I just, I'm seeing that in both World War One and World War Two, and it just, it's just really interesting to me that they're able to produce those numbers without having a huge, huge population, you know, or what I would consider, I think they have like 150 million people now, I think, which is less than half of the, the United States. Um, so I don't know, uh, maybe I don't have the proper perspective on that. It's just kind of like the sense that I'm getting um, as I learn more about these wars. But anyway, um, we'll leave it there and um, Thanks guys for watching. If you did enjoy this video, make sure to like and subscribe. As always, I would certainly appreciate that. And you could also uh, check out my social media on uh, in the pinned comment and the description of, of this video if you're interested in any of that stuff. I also have my mailing address, Patreon links there as well. Um, Roger here and I, thank you guys for watching. As always, Scarlet has given up her chase of squirrels and she is now laying down under my desk. So anyway, yes, I hope you guys will join us next time for Switzerland and the Red Baron. Look forward to learning more about those two things. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for that and we'll see you next time.